you know, why, why antipsychotics in long-term care? Why reducing them? You know, what sparked the whole uh, initiative and collaborative? Yeah, well, this is really about um, improving the lives of seniors and our residents in long-term care and the quality, quality of life um, and care experience. Um, we know that in long-term care, um, CHI High, Canadian Institute for Health uh, Care Improvement, Healthcare information um, has a study that showed that one in four residents in long term care are inappropriately prescribed antipsychotics. Uh, our organization also had a, a team from one of our other programs that had been tackling the issue in Winnipeg, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. So we had two leaders in the field. Um, Cynthia Sinclair and Joe Puchniak, who had started on initiatives in their region to see improvement, and they had some great results. Um, and so with this burning platform that was um, clear in, across Canada, uh, as well as knowing that we had some leadership on our side, uh, part of our mandate is to accelerate the spread of innovation. And, and we did that working with Cynthia and and Joe and, and a woman named Lauren Mitchell um, and, and wanted to bring together a collective of, of organizations and leaders and frontline staff who want are committed to, to moving this mandate. How do you determine what is inappropriate use of antipsychotics in people with dementia? Or do, is it so? Was it people with dementia? Was it elderly, uh, broader category of elderly? And yeah, how do you how do you determine what's inappropriate use and what's appropriate use? Well, it's a good question, um, and it's an indicator. As I mentioned, uh, Kai Hai, there's a whole set of indicators or measures that are used um, in long-term care to be able to assess residents' experience in care, and so the um, the indicator of whether or not a resident was on uh, uh, antipsychotic, whether or not they had a diagnosis of psychosis is the indicator. So if they're on the drug but don't actually have a, a diagnosis of psychosis, that's how you know that someone is inappropriately on it. So um, particularly the evidence shows us that and the written research over the years has shown us that um, you know non-pharmacological or, or non-medication approaches to dementia care um, are are the really the first should be the first line option um, when you're trying to deal with and, and, and work with the behavioral symptoms that a lot of people with dementia and long-term care have. So right now there's a very high prevalence of dementia in um, long-term care. It's at about uh, 62% um, of, of people in long-term care do you have some um, level of dementia. And so with that comes some challenging behaviors that staff do their best to uh, manage um, however, in the past number of years, um, medications have been a part of that management um, and have been prescribed not necessarily um, as, the, uh, as, as they're indicated to be prescribed. Um, so that's what we're trying to work on is, is bringing in approaches that are called uh, patient or person-centered care approaches to care that really deal more with the behavioral needs of, of seniors and residents um, as a first-line option. So if you take away the antipsychotics, if you, you reduce the, either discontinue them completely or you reduce the dosage, uh, it seems to me that you would then have to do something differently in order to um, manage these behaviors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things would you need to do differently? What are the non-pharmacological approaches that the teams are using? Yeah, no, um, there's a number of different strategies. There's a, a couple of models out there. One of them is called PIECES, and it, it focuses on physical, intellectual, um, the, 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 the environment, um, and the social and cultural needs of, of residents or seniors. And, and so really, it, it's just that. It's looking at, okay, physically, 
what might be going on in a, a senior or a person with dementia who um, what, that is causing them to have certain behaviors. So when you're living with dementia, you, you know, you might be hearing different things. You might be super sensitive to touch. You might be needing um, food or, or drink or, or some, some of your basic needs at, at a different time than when, say, a, a long-term care home or a nursing home might be providing you with food. Um, if you were a shift worker and and worked um, nights and and slept days, perhaps you you're used to a different um, a feeding schedule or eating schedule. So so there's just some physical aspects that you know the that's part of assessing the resident's needs, and then as a result, some of the strategies that can be used. Uh, similarly, um, you know you look at recreational therapy. So we're talking about music therapy, how, allowing people to use music and rhythm as a as a form of an alternative way to kind of get some of that stimuli and that memory um, collection back. Um, we're talking about gardening, uh, we're talking about art therapy. There's, there's a number of different recreational therapies that our team's brought in to try to help stimulate some of the creative functions and the, the I guess, the, the stimuli that is, uh, is helpful to get the nervous system um, alive and well. And why do you think that those kinds of things are not being currently used in many long-term care facilities? Well, and th th there's certainly a number of facilities that do have, you know, things like recreational therapy and different person-centered approaches to care like pieces or you first. Um, there's something called the Eden approach. I, I think that, you know, it, it largely comes down to a culture of care um, where everyone is trained up. So that was something that was unique about this collaborative and this initiative that we did um, is that a big part of it was training teams of healthcare providers. So to use these person-centered approaches. So they, we brought in the physicians, nurses, pharmacists, um, personal support workers, dietitians, um, even, even sometimes, you know, um, the, the people doing laundry. Um, as well, a critical component of this was bringing in the family. So these were what we called the care teams. And a big part of our work was, was helping care teams form, helping them understand the types of different assessments they can do using what we called a pieces approach, a person-centered approach to care, and then doing assessments based on, you know, a very responsible way to come off of the drugs if they were inappropriately prescribed. Um, and so ways that they can identify the, the residents who were inappropriately prescribed, um, strategies that they can use to slowly get them off so that they can be monitoring any behavior changes or adverse effects that might be going on. So, so in summary, it was really about um, the, the challenge that a lot of homes have and, and why it's sometimes difficult for all the stars to align and pieces to come together is, is having the care teams who work together to make this happen because it's not just about one person or one leader coming in and saying, you know, let's let's make make a change here. It has to come from multiple points of connection. It was about bringing in these person-centered approaches and it was about responsible um, titration or coming off of the drugs and using data to do that. So that was three key parts of our of our collaborative that we did a lot of training in. And that's, I think, why you don't see it always succeeding is because of the, the important kind of components that need to align to make that happen. So you would have a long-term care facility uh, who would be part of this program. How did they, um, how did people become enlisted? How did you choose the facilities? Did they volunteer? What was that process? Yeah, so what we did is initially we put out a call um, where we, um, you know, advertise it on our website, we put out calls, um, our phone calls, so different connections that we have. Um, we posted to different uh, long-term care um, forums and just let uh, the world to our best ability in Canada know that this initiative was going on. Um, we had a number of um, of applications and we did what we call merit review process where um, teams applied they ha we had a form that they filled out we looked at things like homes and their team readiness to actually take this on so did they have a CEO and a leader who was kind of 
standing behind this and, and agreeing that this is a priority and agreeing that they would release some of their staff time for training. Uh, did they have a team and show that they had the key roles that need to be a part of a project team? So did they have a clinical champion, so a physician on board, uh, a nurse and a personal support worker on board, a pharmacist on board? And did they have a family member who was either going to be on the team or that they had access to so we could make sure that there was always the family member voice a part of it. So kind of showing signs on their applications that there's a, a strong leadership, strong team, and then also, you know, just in their um, writing and their ability to demonstrate uh, their, their plan, initial plan, because we worked with them on their planning in the first number of months, but that they were committed. Um, another key component for this collaborative um, was the use of something called the InterI MDS. And InterI is a a system, it's an international system, but um, it's used in Canada in a number of different sectors and it's picked up quite a bit in the long term care sector over the last 10 15 years. And it's a data system that essentially um, long term care facilities use to track residents' um, quality of life and different health indicators. So um, it, it essentially, it's not mandatory. Um, all homes can be using different systems. And again, the prevalence of intra-I is becoming more and more across the country. And so what we did was in order for us to be able to understand baseline and changes in results, we, a part of the mandatory requirement was that the homes were using data and the intra-I system. Um, in, in, in assessing and tracking the residents' um, health and quality of life. Um, and so that way, as a collaborative, we can really understand the results overall. So that was what some of the defining features. Okay, so you, you have this process, the homes get, or the facilities get selected, and then you have a team or one person or who goes and meets with the with the facility and then what happens so so we had a process for applying um, we then had a, a workshop um, that launched it and we brought all of the homes together so there's 15 organizations or homes that um, were accepted into the program. Um, they did receive some funding um, to, to support them to travel to this workshop where we had a two-day kind of education and training um, on, you know, how they set up their implementation and spread plans, how they start to define what their aims are, what they're going to measure, what the specific strategies that they're going to use in terms of the person-centered approaches to care. So introducing them at that workshop to what we call the pieces model. Um, so really that workshop was kind of our way. We brought the teams together um, to, to gel and to, to start to build momentum. And over the course of the 14 months of the collaborative, um, what we did was monthly and, and sometimes twice a month, what we call webinars. So it was online training education so they would be over lunch hours usually about an hour and a half in length we would bring in um, faculty um, who have expertise in the different topic areas that we were addressing and all of the team members would dial in be a part of a video conference that would essentially give them the training they would work through their different um, forms and, um, and, and planning. And after about two or three months, that's when we really started to see the home start to implement. So they kind of took the two or three months to really come up with their, assess their home, assess the residents' level of antipsychotic use, get the data they needed, get the buy-in and engagement from the different healthcare um, staff within their organization and their senior management, and really start to build that momentum. And then you start, start to see them implementing and they had about um, one year just under a year of implementation while they were formerly a part of our collaborative so you said there were 15 one five organizations but there were 56 home 56 facilities in total is, is that correct yeah so how it worked was we started with 15 organization and and this was initially designed to be exactly that, a spread collaborative. So we wanted to train them up on the different um, activities and, and ways that they can make change. But a big part of it was planning for spreads so that we didn't like get caught in what we call pilot projects. So it was one project that 
doesn't last as soon as it's over. So all of this was designed where the homes identified early on where they would test and implement um, the initiative. So of the 15 organizations, they then spread the initiative to 56 other facilities. A number of the homes have multiple sites, so that's how we got to 56 facilities across Canada. So there's a big train the trainer approach here. So we did the training, that two day workshop launch as an example, then they got their plan in place over two months and started to train others and started to work and be, build their own teams within their multiple facilities. So that was the kind of how we built the momentum in that and then in a grassroots approach to doing that. Um, and, and all of the homes and team members were all invited to join these educational sessions that we would have with the core group, and that's how it really spread. They then submitted information to us on their results on a quarterly basis, so we could feed that back at the aggregate level and, and share with the homes you know, what kind of progress we're seeing along the way, which is really important for change, and to have those clear aims, accountable measures, and a feedback loop to, to people who are involved to kind of see what's happening. Maybe, you know, in some cases, homes realized that they were having issues with the actual coding of the information. So some people maybe were um, 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 doing something called coding um, in a different way than another home uh, in their facility. So they had, they kind of sometimes would make progress, but they need to back up to make sure that they were all kind of consistent in, in how they're approaching the change. That sounds like an awesome model. I just love it. Yeah, and that's why it's called a collaborative. It's a, it's a matrix approach. It, it really involves building some core fundamental core capacities and competencies with a core group and, and getting them equipped to become champions. And that's what this change management process is all about. Um, and, and then focus on really clear defined uh, objectives, aims, using measures to see the change. And, and really, you know, when, when you think about the question of, all the great work that is going on across the country, and there has been in the last couple of years, there's certainly been movement on the issue of inappropriate prescribing of antipsychotics. You see it in provinces like BC, they have a clear, something called the CLEAR initiative. In Alberta, they have the appropriate use of antipsychotic initiative. In Saskatchewan and Ontario, they're setting benchmarks and it's becoming a part of their quality improvement plans and, and what a provincial priority. So you're seeing movement, but a big part of it is how do you, how do you build the capacity and the competencies across the multiple sectors and professionals that need it. Um, and and that's, that's the approach that we've taken through this collaborative approach and that's the approach that we're looking forward to continuing to spreading. Why uh, aren't, you know, I live in Quebec, that's where I reside and so um, I'm, I'm a little bit focused on what's happening here and I'm wondering why there were no facilities in Quebec part of the uh, part of the collaborative and uh, well I'll stop there and go go on to my next question after you answer this one. No problem so for this first Pan Canadian collaborative the um, initial attempt we made as I mentioned in terms of um, intake was that all homes needed to be um, using the interride because that was really important for us to on this first go at it. It was our own test of, of, of doing this initiative. So it was important for us to have uh, homes that collected common data. Um, so in that we learned along the way that Quebec was not using, no one in Quebec was using the interride system at the time. Um, and so it was literally based on we didn't have any applications from Quebec. None of them were on the system that we were using standard across the way. Now since then, I've been learning more and continue to learn more about the Quebec landscape. And they, um, there are homes that are use a common, uh, some of the homes use a common system, and I'm happy to share that, um, that information with you um, right after this interview, the name of the system that's being used. And I have heard word that, you know, more and more um, homes are looking at uh, using interi going forward and bringing that system on board um, but it, it's a, it's a pretty uh, important initiative to 
to have, again, that leadership and have provincial backing on. So it, it's not necessarily a quick process or a quick change, but I mean, there's certainly, it's an international system. Um, France uses it quite readily. And, and so, I mean, it does come in multiple languages. So the language shouldn't necessarily be a barrier. I think it, it largely has been that the Quebec homes were using a different system. Um, and, and, and so for the next time around when we do it, I mean, currently we are in the province of New Brunswick and and uh, the New Brunswick province came to us wanting to scale um, across the province this initiative to all of their long-term long care homes in the province. So we just launched that initiative about a month ago, which is really exciting because we're essentially looking at tackling the province. Um, and in that, we're now offering it as a bilingual program. So going forward, we will have the English-French capacity. Um, and, and, and in the future, you know, um, if there are homes from Quebec interested in joining up on a collaborative, we'd be happy to, to look at that opportunity. Um, what problems and issues and challenges did the facilities face what were the top challenges they faced in moving forward with the um, process? I would say that what we've heard from the homes and, and through some of the evaluation that we've done, there's a couple of things at play here in terms of some of the challenges and bar barriers to the process and to sustaining. Um, one of them would be what they call the, you know, can be turnaround of staff. So how you ensure you have the resources in place to train new people coming in based on the staff turnaround. And that, when we talked about this model of training the trainer and the importance of having team members on board, in any organization, in any sector you're dealing with, that, that time and that energy and the ability to properly train your staff on these techniques and to be part of that culture was one of the number one, I think, um, I don't want to say challenges, but one of the number one flags that, that our teams let us know could be barriers to sustainability as they go forward is how they continue to make sure they have the champions on the ground who are driving this and the attention that's needed to the training. Um, and and that, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, a ton of time off work or, or you know, more money and resources for training that, you know, are outside the budget. It just means what processes and policies are then in place place when you have new staff come on board. So some of our homes in order, in order to overcome that have now made it a policy that all of the new staff coming in are trained in these techniques uh, as a part of their um, initial probation period in their training. So those are that's an example of a, of a challenge and, and how a couple of teams started to overcome that. Another challenge um, some of the homes talked about was goes back to some of the, for instance, the physician engagement. Um, how you get different um, uh, healthcare providers on board with this initiative um, and, and what it means in terms of how you communicate with them, what kind of evidence is important for them to have as you as you talk to your physicians, uh, whether they're physicians that are in the homes themselves and serve the homes or if they're contracted from out, um, how do you ensure that the different physicians that might be coming in and out are on board and understand the initiative, understand the reasons for it and help support it. So a big part of our training was around some of that physician engagement. Um, and then and then I would say a final, you know, just a final comment on some of the challenges was around the use of the data. Not all homes, um, you know, equally have the capacity and the time to consistently use data for um, assessing and monitoring. And so some of our homes, you know, which are sometimes they're a lot smaller homes, um, don't necessarily have the resources. So how it, it often goes back to resources and how you make sure that despite the model that you have structurally in your organization, that you know you adapt um, to have the right resources that can look at the data, that can support the teams in understanding the residents' um, current status and, and moving it forward. Do you have any system that uh, tracks the uh, various factors uh, or potential uh, factors that might uh, impact uh, facilities or an organization's ability to implement um, 
this new way of to implement person-centered care for example uh, does the ratio of uh, care worker to uh, residents have an impact does the salary level or the compensation packages of the care workers have an impact um, those are a couple of factors that I can think of, or, or the, the size of the facility. You know, is, a, is a facility with 100 residents more likely to be successful than one that has 50? Mm -hmm. um, and, and do you have a, a list of those potential factors? Or is that something that you, that, that you tracked or not? Yeah, we, we started to, um, and we've had, we're currently in the process of some of that final analysis. There's a lot of variables that we are collecting data on, and, and so I would say that in this round, the Pan-Canadian round, we have some information, obviously, on the size of the homes, um, on, on, we have some information on the staff skill mix, um, but it's, it's data that we're definitely still working with to kind of understand if there's an actual statement we can make about the, the, the impacts of using these different variables. Um, for our upcoming collaborators, it's certainly something that, as I mentioned, this was a, this was a, the, the Pan-Canadian Collaborative was a first model for us on this particular issue. So we have some learnings to come out of it. And as we go forward, what kind of factors and variables would we want to make sure to include? And, and, and what you just identified are certainly areas we're interested in learning about. Um, but, and, and I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind as, a, as an improvement foundation is, is we're working with homes for quality improvement. And so what a part of our job is to really do a nice balance between you know um, quality improvement and research because uh, this isn't wasn't necessarily a research study so we have to be really I guess sensitive and, and, and balance out how much information and data we're expecting of the homes and of the teams and how much we can turn this into a study or not so that's uh, that's also a fine part of the balance as well yeah because I guess you want to try to avoid making it hard work it should be as easy as possible for the uh, homes to implement uh, the person-centered approach otherwise it, you won't be as successful in making it happen that's right the evidence behind these interventions um, is, is already out in the uh, in, 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 in writing and in the research um, and, and so that side of it's co complete and and now this has really been about having homes having tools that they can be using and doing with and, and like you said making it um, allowing them to test it a lot allowing them to correct different and, and adapt it where they need it to make it context specific um, and then the homes were certainly very helpful in helping us understand what the different factors are and what we're learning um, across the different sites. But, but going forward, again, certainly kind of that case study approach where we can understand, maybe take a couple of homes and really magnifying on them that those that want to kind of participate in that type of work will certainly be helpful for answering the types of questions that you have. So what did you learn from them? You, you, you gave them a bunch of information, a lot of information it sounds like, and uh, knowledge, tools, techniques, support. W were you surprised by anything that came back to you and what kinds of things did you learn uh, that you didn't know at the beginning of the process, if anything? Yeah, we had, there's a, a lot that we learned around, you know, for instance, how to, or, or, or let me just take a step back, a lot we learned around some of, for instance, how the teams interacted and worked with pharmacists. We had a lot of pharmacist champions as a part of the, of the initiative and really kind of learning some of those techniques that our homes use, as well as the families. Our homes were so creative in how they got the families involved and engaged in this. Such a key part. So working with some of the family councils, um, getting family members on their team directly, um, bringing family members in early on, leaving little pamphlets for them at the side of their resident of their loved ones um, bed in order to give them information about the initiative there were kickoff parties there were celebrations there was story writing and there there was a lot that the teams um, kind of did in that was above and beyond what uh, was a part of our um, I would say approach that, uh, that that they shared with each other each other which was fantastic 
Um, so, so I would say really a lot of it was around how the homes and the teams became creative and, and focused on engaging some of those key and critical stakeholders when it came to family members and other clinicians. So how important is, is it for family members to be involved in this kind of, in, in the person-centered care approach and in what ways should they be involved? Yeah, it, it really is important. Um, the family members are often those that know the resident best and the ability for the family member to um, be a part of the decision making of are they going to be, a, do they want their loved one to um, try to come off the drugs? Um, what kind of different recreational strategies or other um, sensitive um, information about the family member can they share with the staff who are part of the team um, to, to make sure that the right approaches are being used. These were all critical um, inputs and sources of information that um, as team members that you know are invaluable for making sure that the right type of care is provided. So are, are you saying that some family members would not, would want their uh, mother, father, wife, husband, whatever, to remain on medication rather than to be taken off medication? Well, I, I think, again, it goes back to just making sure that the family members are a part of the decision point. So in some cases, there, you know, there were a couple of family members or, or instances where they wouldn't necessarily be comfortable because this is a course of action that they think is best and want to stay on. They um, are a bit nervous about trying something else. So it, it, it certainly is, it was... Um, important for educating family members on it, um, but also for listening to any of the family members' fears or concerns. I mean, you often got fears or concerns, not just from family members, but from nurses, from, from doctors around taking them off the drug. There was some educating to do around it. A big part of why residents are put on the drugs was because of an attempt to help manage some of the challenging behaviors that often go around with conditions like dementia, aggression, resistance to care, um, and inappropriate behaviors. And so, so there was, there's, in terms of changing the culture, both for whether it's a family member or the, um, some of the practitioners, it was about educating them about, you know, ways to, to, to test it and, and, and bring them off the drugs in a responsible way that will help them see the effects and see that coming off the drugs does not necessarily mean an, an increase in negative behaviors. That's what our work showed, that, that they actually decreased in their behaviors by 20 to 30% um, in appropriate behavior. So that's a big part of this. And, and I, I don't think it's just the family members being, someone of the family members being resistance, but sometimes you saw resistance from other staff as well. So there was clear, it, it was absolutely crystal clear that uh, in, would you say most cases, that taking people, or re reducing the amount of antipsychotic medication that they were on, uh, or taking them off the medication completely, did not result in uh, an increase in um, problematic responsive behaviors in fact, it resulted in a decrease of, of such behaviors. Is that so, correct? So at the end of our third quarter, so we had data from a baseline to three quarters. That's what was avail is available to us at this point. We saw a 54% um, discontinuation and reduction of the antipsychotics. Um, and in that 20% reduction in falls, uh, one third decrease in verbal and physical behaviors, and then 20% decreases in resistance to care. So, so yeah, from the data that we had for that time period, that's what we were observing. So big part of it for the homes now that they're using the data is to keep their eye on those other indicators and make sure and see that they're either going down or not increasing. The main thing was not to see them increase and we didn't see them increase and in fact, for the time period of data that we had, we saw them decrease. So it's kind of, it's over the homes now that the collaborative is complete to pay attention, not just to whether or not they're the inappropriately prescribed residents are off the drugs, but that they're now other indicators of, of, of 
challenging or, or difficult behaviors of falls, et cetera, aren't increasing. So that's, a, that's an important part of the training and of the indicators to look out for. So uh, moving, tell me a little bit about New Brunswick. You're tackling the whole province. So we have 15 homes a part of uh, phase one and the remaining over 50 homes a part of phase two. Uh, we launched last month, we have $600,000 committed from the Department of Social Development and uh, we're ecstatic. We're working in partnership with the New Brunswick Association of Nursing Homes and they're great partners and we're gonna really be able to drive the change uh, along the way. So we're essentially modeling what we did in the Pan-Canadian Collaborative across New Brunswick. Um, and we actually last week we were just in New Brunswick for a launch workshop uh, where we brought the homes together to uh, to to get them going and uh, on their way with their implementation spread and measurement planning. So we're very excited about that initiative. So it's fifteen one five homes to start with, and then phase two, which will be a year long. Yeah, it's, so it'll be a year long initiative, and phase two will start up next year at this time. Um, and, and with the idea, of, again, a big part of this is to find that local mentorship. So we're looking to some of these 15 homes who are part of phase one to then come on board um, to help mentor and coach some of the homes that will be a part of phase two and really building up the, the provincial and regional capacity to, to support each other on it. So uh, one five in phase one and then five zero fifty in phase two two that's the plan how many people does that uh, impact how many elderly people living residents does that impact yeah so we have i want to say the numbers and i'm going to send you the numbers just after uh, after this call uh actually to to verify but we'll essentially be hitting all of the residents um in new brunswick and and I actually haven't looked at those numbers in the last month or so, so that they're not um, coming to my mind, but I will certainly send you, share with you those after the call. It surely must be in the thousands, though. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right, yeah. That's I, I, don't, I don't like misquoting numbers, so. No. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I commit to a number, I like it to be on, so I will, I will share that information with you right after the, the, the call. That's okay. Uh, and beyond that, I mean, that's a fairly large project, I would think. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the rest of the country, uh, are there, do you have plans or uh, things in place or? Yeah, so essentially beyond New Brunswick, we're right now um, presenting, as, as I mentioned, I'll be presenting in Toronto at the Dementia Care Conference uh, next month at the National Health Leadership Conference. We're working with a number of our pan-Canadian homes um, in the last six months. We've been presenting across the different provinces. So really, at this point, what we're doing is, um, you know, continuing to spread the word about the initiative, about some of the great work of the homes, about the learnings, and to work with some of the quality councils across the provinces and any of the provinces that want to join and, and start to look at what um, other forms of collaboratives in different provinces or between provinces could look like. Okay, I think that probably covers, well, I, I must say I loved all the financial stuff that you had in your release because I think that's where you, a lot of people focus on what are the cost savings going to yes. be. Yes. Yeah, so we had um, a big part of this, obviously, improving the lives of residents, the quality of care, the quality of life, and then as well as understanding the value that this brings. So a big part of this, um, right after the initiative, um, we undertook a return on investment analysis, um, where we just wanted to learn a little bit about you know, if this were scaled across the country, what could that look like? So we know from the results that we achieve, that our homes achieve, that if this were scaled across the country in five years, that 35,000 uh, seniors would actually be off um, antipsychotics who don't have a diagnosis of psychosis uh, projections based on some of the, the, the numbers going forward. Um, that 25 
million prescriptions would actually be avoided and that we could look at over 200 million in savings um, to the to the healthcare system and that could be redirected into you know like we talked about other areas other resources into the into the, the care system so also a big part of this is that we know that this isn't just a long-term care issue um, just over uh, just around 60% of the residents who are part of our initiative came into the homes already prescribed the antipsychotics. So we know that, you know, in long-term care, they're having to, the staff are having to manage and deal with a lot of this, but we have to look to the hospitals. We have to look to community care um, initiatives and, 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 and primary care. And, and also this is a, a critical area that needs to needs for their work and, and support on um, to make sure that the prescribing that's done outside of long-term care um, is also addressed. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, massive educational component uh, mm -hmm. with respect to people who are drafted into caregiving roles and who don't have any skills whatsoever yeah. and uh, these problems arise they don't know how to deal with it they go to the family physician and automatically that you get a, a prescription that's how it goes <laughs> Yeah, so a big part of it, again, for what we're working in long-term care is, you know, a lot of our homes are now instilling, instituting policies where they're, you know, that medication management happens upon admission into the homes to understand the different, you know, drugs that they're coming in on. Um, but yeah, the, the whole cross-sector education and awareness that needs to go on is certainly at the root of this as well and, and, and certainly needs to be addressed. Well, it strikes me, you mentioned earlier that, uh, well, you alluded to the fact that there could be resistance on behalf of physicians uh, to reducing uh, the, amount, the amount of antipsychotic medication. And it seems to me that that's, a, that's the primary source because people do trust their doctor when they go in and say, you know, what can I do about this? How can I manage this better? And when there aren't any other answers other than, well, here's a pill, it seems that, you know, that it's, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's where having the physicians comfortable and aware and, and referring to other behavioral support approaches to care um, is, is a big part of this training. And we certainly have a number of physician champions that are a part of this and they're going to be key um, as we continue to move forward and work with different homes and, and across sectors on this initiative. Um. There have been a, as I, I, I wrote uh, in my, the questions that I sent you, it seems to me that there have been waves of publicity around this issue over the past 10 or 15 years, maybe even longer than that. And yet we still have the same problems with respect to the prescription of these drugs. And in Quebec, in fact, uh, which will, I, I talk about another time, but instead of going you know, down, the number of prescriptions is rising. Um, do you think this is another flash in the pan, if you will, that uh, will there there's a, be a spike of of goodwill and uh, some small changes, and then things will go back to the old normal? A big part of this initiative in the initial design and, and what we're, you know, doing everything we can to be committed to is to design for sustainability. And, and, and that goes back to what I was talking about around um, creating plans, the homes creating plans and training where they can be ready for what does spread look like? What does actual culture change look like? And those are the things that are needed for this to stick. Um, we also need leadership commitment. We also need the provinces on board and creating it as, as, as key priorities. So I certainly, you know, I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm remiss to think that this initiative means that Canada 
is now ready, is now about to change in its practices across long-term care. We're, we're certainly looking at incremental change. We're certainly looking at, you know, the 56 homes. We just had a, a touch base with our homes uh, two days ago um, to get an update nine months later, and, and they're starting to tell us, you know, where they have spread to, you know, what additional four facilities they've spread to, or another 12 facilities, or they haven't spread because actually they had leadership changes and staff turnover, and, and this has not you know, they're, they're doing their best just to sustain. So, you know, there's gonna be, a, there's a lot of pieces and factors at play. So I, I certainly think that it's a burning platform. We know that one in four residents are inappropriately prescribed antipsychotics, and that has recently, again, um, changed to one in three as of February. We know that the dementia rates are going up. We know that there's the aging senior population that needs to be dealt with, as well as the prescribing rates that go on. Um, so the burning platforms out there we certainly see a lot of committed leaders, both at the nursing home, long-term care home, and provincial levels more and more. Uh, we certainly see a lot of um, family members um, and, uh, who are advocating for these changes, and, and that that pool needs to, to continue to grow. Um, and then you have organizations like ours, you have initiatives like Choosing Wisely Canada, that's really talking about appropriate conversations that can be had with your physicians and providers. You have initiatives like the Degree Prescribing Network, led by uh, Dr. Kara Tenenbaum and, and others that are really looking at uh, ways to understand you know, the multiple effects of drugs and how to safely come off them. So, so I, I definitely see the work growing. I started in this field about 15 years ago in my master's work, and 15 years later, I'm working on Pan-Canadian Collaborative. We know that change takes time and 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 people like yourself and your group and myself are part of this initiative and it will continue to need to be a, a burning platform and, and and we know that there's room for improvement i'm hoping we don't see decline um but but it, what it, it's doing is taking these multiple groups to to help make that change so i just uh, a clarification on this one and three and one and four mm -hmm. um you were saying that one in four are inappropriately prescribed. Is that correct? Yeah. And it's gone, it's changed from which direction is it going in? I'm sorry about that. If there's mis uh, mis miscommunication there, it was, it's currently at um, one in four. It was at one in three. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It sounded yeah. like there was. So it was at one in three. Um, and then it has now come to one in four as of February. Okay, over what time frame? Um, the earlier, last report was February. I believe the earlier one was, I want to say it was 2012 or 2013 that that last Sky High report came out. Okay, so in so, three years, it's, uh, it's, uh, well, I don't know what the exact ratio what, is. Yeah, what we need to do is look at the dates and that timing, so. Yeah, okay. Um, are you familiar with the work of uh, Dr. Al Alan Power? I'm he, not. He wrote the uh, book, well, he's written two books, in fact, um, one called Dementia Beyond Drugs, okay. and the other called uh, Dementia Beyond Disease. Yeah. And he's very active in... Uh, the worldwide movement uh, toward person-centered care. And in a recent blog, he suggested that um, we're, we're getting at the low-hanging fruit in the sense that uh, what you've said is that the homes and organizations that are part of the collaborative are you know they're willing and wanting and keen to make change <clears throat> there are probably a whole lot of people out there who don't want to change what about those people mm -hmm. how do you attack that mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's essentially what we've been talking about you need to build the champions and the willing leaders and so you know that that movement that we see where you know, we get physician champions, pharmacist champions, family champions on board, um, the nurse practitioner champion. So it, sometimes it takes kind of the different um, professional powers to ha be, have peer influence on their, their group. So it's not just, um, you know, uh, 
good, it's not just going to happen. Um, and, and that's where it also takes sometimes, you know, that peer pressure combined with um, that burning platform combined with you know, you know, having some regional and, and provincial leaders who are standing out and, and, and voicing concern. So I think it really comes down to influencers and we have early adopters right now and it's going to just like models of diffusion and innovation, it will take those champions to help, uh, help make the change. Okay, great. Well, thanks a lot. Do you want to add anything, any key things that you want to throw into the end of the conversation? No, I think we've covered a lot of grounds and, and certainly, again, the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, we're so, uh, we're so pleased to have been able to take on this work uh, with all the homes and the teams that were a part of it. They were key to driving the change. Um, we're really keen to continue to explore opportunities to continue this collaborative approach for appropriate prescribing of antipsychotics and, and making sure that our seniors and are receiving the best quality of care um, that, that they can have the, have the most fulfilling lives that they can have. So yeah, we're